turn in your Bibles here to 1 Kings chapter 2. We read a little bit last time because of the last words, the wisdom of, of King David to his son Solomon. But we'll pick up here uh, lesson 31, Solomon's justice, starting in 1 Kings chapter 2 at verse 12. There were some things that David had left for his son Solomon, some loose ends to tie up. Solomon was now the king, so the sword of the king was now given to Solomon. So he had to take care of a few things here that were out of David's hands anymore, just as Mr. Trump will take over the responsibilities that uh, President Obama has before him right now. So maybe there's a man who's waiting to be put to death, and that the final decision falls to the president, where he could grant clemency or not. But uh, the day that Mr. Trump takes office, that responsibility now becomes his. It's no longer President Obama. So President Obama can't do anything. So we see the same here. It's been passed to Solomon. Okay? Uh, there's a little bit of trouble in the land. Solomon's got to take care of it because we know that Solomon's rule will be a reign of peace. So verse 12 of 1 Kings chapter 2. Then sat Solomon upon the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. And Adonijah, the son of Haggah, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and said unto her, and, and, and she said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. He said, Moreover, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And she said, Say on. And he said, Thou knowest that the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel set their faces on me, that I should reign. Howbeit the kingdom is turned about, and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. And now I ask one petition of thee, deny me not. And she said unto him, Say on. And he said, Speak, I pray thee, unto Solomon the king, for he will not say thee nay, that he give me, give me Abishag the Shunammite to wife. And Bathsheba said, Well, I will speak for thee unto the king. Bathsheba therefore went unto Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her, and bowed himself unto her, and sat down on his throne, and caused a seat to be set for the king's mother. And she sat on his right hand. Then she said, I desire one small petition of thee. I pray thee, say me not nay. And the king said unto her, Ask on my mother, for I will not say thee nay. And she said, Let Abishag might be given to Adonijah thy brother to wife. And king Solomon answered and said unto his mother, Why dost thou ask? Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah. Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother, even for him and for Abiathar the priest and for Joab the son of Zeruiah. Then King Solomon swear by the Lord, saying, God do so to me and more so also, if Adonijah have not spoken this word against his own life. Now therefore, as the Lord liveth, which hath established me and set me on the throne of David my father, and who hath made me in house as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death this day. And King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he fell upon him that died. So Adonijah's desire to become king had been quickly stopped by the work, quick work of Dave, King David and Solomon and Nathan and Bathsheba. Adonijah wanted to be the king. He tried to become the king. The people declared him the king. But it wasn't right before the Lord. And so very quickly, Adonijah, we saw all those friends slink away from his party. Well, Adonijah is still at it again. He's not going to start an open rebellion. He's not going to try to convince all the people to be on his side anymore. He's not going to gather the army together because that won't work. That will be treason. He goes a different route. He tries to do it sneakily. He tries to do the same things that Absalom, his brother had, or half-brother, had done. Remember when David had to flee out of Jerusalem, he left behind ten concubines? What did Absalom do when he came into the city? He immediately took those concubines to be his. Be his wives. Because that was a symbol, therefore, of becoming a king. If you, if the king dies, or if the king is put out, or if the king goes away, and someone else takes the palace and begins living with the former king's wives. That's the sign that you are now the king. And Adonijah knows that. And again, he doesn't go directly to Solomon to ask for permission, 
But he goes to Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, and he asks Bathsheba if she will go in for him. Because Solomon won't say no to you. If I walk in before the king, before his throne, he might say no to me, and then, then it's off with my head. No, if you go into him, he'll allow you to, to speak to you. So you ask your son this. Uh, so Bathsheba uh, went in. She asked. King Solomon became angry. Okay? He became upset with her, and, and he understood what Adonijah was trying to do. And so he gave him a death sentence. So before, it was only a little while before that Solomon had pardoned Adonijah because Adonijah had begged for his life. And now already Solomon has to put him to death because he's trying to, again, take over the throne in a in a uh, sneaky way. All right? But what about some other people? We just read in there that in his anger when Solomon was was speaking to his mother, Mother, if I give him Abishag, should I give him Joab and Abiathar too? Should he have all of them? Meaning, well, why don't you just make him, make him king? He can have all of the leaders and rulers then. Well, let's go on to Abiathar and Joab. What, about, what does Solomon have to do about them? Verse 26, please follow along there. And unto Abiathar the priest said the king, Get thee to Anathoth unto thine own fields, for thou art worthy of death. But I will not at this time put thee to death, because thou bearest the ark of the Lord God before David my father, and because thou hast been afflicted in awe, wherein my father was afflicted. So Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being priest unto the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord, which he spake unto Eli in Shiloh. Then tidings came to Joab. So that's Abiathar. Now Joab. For Joab had turned after Adonijah, though he turned not after Absalom. And Joab fled unto the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold of the horns of the altar. And it was told King Solomon that Joab was fled unto the tabernacle of the Lord and behold, he is by the altar. Then Solomon sent Benaiah unto the son of Jehoiada saying, Go, fall upon him. And Benaiah came to the tabernacle of the Lord and said unto him, Thus saith the king, Come forth. And he saith, and he said, Nay, but I will die here. And Benaiah brought the king word again, saying, Thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. And the king said unto him, Do as he hath said, and fall upon him and bury him, that thou mayest take away the innocent blood which Joab shed from me and from the house of my father. And the Lord shall return his head upon his own head, who fell upon two men more righteous and better than he, and slew them with the sword. My father David, not knowing thereof to it. Abner the son of Ner, captain of the host of Israel, and Amasa the son of Jether, captain of the host of Judah. Their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his seed forever. But upon David and upon his seed and upon his house and upon his throne shall there be peace forever from the Lord. So Benaiah the son of Jehoiada went up and fell upon him and slew him. And he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. So we have another man put to death here. Abiathar had committed the sin of treason. Okay. And because, remember, he had fled David and Solomon. He had gone to Adonijah, so he deserves some punishment. Uh, But because he is a high priest, Solomon respects his office. He strips him of being high priest, and he sends him to another place. You no longer can be priest. Well, Joab hears this. He goes, okay, Adonijah just got killed. Abiathar just lost his priesthood. Hmm. I'm probably number three on the list. He's coming after me next. So Joab, what does he do? He runs to the tabernacle, and he grabs hold of the horns there by the altar of burnt offering, showing that he has given his, his life is no longer his, but he's asking for mercy from Solomon and from the Lord. Joab refuses to leave the altar, and he won't. So Solomon orders Benaiah to kill him there. He had killed Amasa. He had killed Abner. Both of them in murder. They were not done in the throes of battle as they should have. Nope. They were murdered. And so Joab too finally meets his end. He is put to death so that there would be peace for David's house in that way. So Those two men too. God's justice is swift and it is good. Now there's one other man that Solomon has to 
deal with that David had left him, and that was Shimei. So we're going to pick that up here at verse 36. And the king sent and called for Shimei and said unto him, Build thee an house in Jerusalem and dwell there, and go not forth thence any thither, any whither. For it shall be that on the day that thou goest out and passest over the brook Kidron, thou shalt know for certain that thou shalt surely die. Thy blood shall be upon thine own head. And Shimei said unto the king, The saying is good. As my lord the king has said, so will thy servant do. And Shimei dwelt in Jerusalem many days. And it came to pass at the end of three years that two of the servants of Shimei ran away unto Achish, the son of Maacah, king of Gath. And they told Shimei, saying, Behold, thy servants be in Gath. And Shimei arose and saddled his ass and went to Gath to Achish to seek his servants. And Shimei went and brought his servants from Gath. And it was told Solomon that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and was come again. And the king sent and called for Shimei and said unto him, Did I not make thee to swear by the Lord? And protested unto thee, saying, No, for a certain on the day thou goest out and walkest abroad any whither thou shalt surely die, and thou sayest unto me, Thy word that I have heard is good. Why then hast thou not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandments that I have charged thee with? The king said moreover to Shimei, Thou knowest all the wickedness which thou, which thine heart is privy to, that thou didst to David my father. Therefore the Lord shall return thy wickedness upon thine own head. And King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, which went out and fell upon him that he died. And the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So Shimei has to be put to death here. He was the man that cursed David, but then when David was returning, he no longer cursed him. Okay? He understood that the only way he could stay alive was to agree to the terms of Solomon. Solomon made an agreement, made him swear an oath that he would stay in the city of Jerusalem. He wouldn't leave and go out and cause more trouble. But Shimei did just that. He left Jerusalem to go out by King Achish. It wasn't necessary for him to go. He could have asked the king to do this on his own, but he didn't. And so, because he broke his promise, Solomon has to kill him. Take his life according to God's law. So, therefore, Solomon has now cleaned up some of the weaknesses, some of the sinful men in Israel. He's had to put to death Shimei. He's had to now put to death Joab. And he's had to put to death Adonijah. And he's taken Abiathar and stripped the priesthood from him. Solomon is doing good. But the Lord has bigger plans for Solomon. The Lord has great work for Solomon. Solomon, Solomon will be writing books of the Bible Solomon will be looked at in great re- with great respect in all of history. And so the Lord needs to give to Solomon something even more. And that's what we read here in chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, if you skip to verse 4, we have the story of the Lord appearing to Solomon in the night. Verse 5. And in Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth, and in righteousness and uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him, a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge the people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy people, so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked for this thing, and thou hast not asked for thyself long life, neither ask for riches for thyself, nor hast thou asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, 
I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall arise any like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked for, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, and keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem, and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and offered up burnt offerings, and offered peace offerings, and made a feast to all his servants. So Solomon is already a great king. He's making good decisions. But the Lord has even bigger plans for him. Solomon had gone to offer some burnt offerings to ask Jehovah for his help and favor, and God did just that. That evening, after Solomon had offered those offerings, prayed to the Lord, the Lord visits him in a dream. Solomon, I'll give you whatever you want. And Solomon being... Not a selfish man here, because if he was selfish, if he was thinking only about himself, he'd say, give me long life. Guarantee that I don't get put to death as a king, because often kings are put to death by jealous people. Or he might have asked for tons of riches, make me the wealthiest king. Or make it so that everybody honors me, everyone thinks of how great I am, they will listen to me. No, no, Solomon says, I am young. I don't have the wisdom of someone older. And I'm going to have to make many decisions for this people Israel. So Lord, help me to make good decisions by giving me wisdom and knowledge. That was a good thing for Solomon to pray for. It was not for himself that he was praying for, but he was asking for that wisdom so that it could be used for the people of Israel. And so God blessed that. He gave that to Solomon. And then he said, because you didn't ask for the other things, I'm going to give them to you anyways, because there will be no man on the face of this earth, who before now has been any wiser than you, and there's no man who will be after you that will have as much wisdom. And there's no man during your lifetime, Solomon, that will have as much riches and honor as you do. You will be well revered among all men. But that's not the main thing. What's the main thing here is that Solomon has wisdom. He has knowledge to know what God's will is, to do what's right, to judge the people. It pleased the Lord. And when Solomon awoke in the morning, he went and he went and found the tabernacle. And there he offered sacrifices. And he did that in a way that pleased the Lord. Because he knew the Lord had visited him in the night and had given him this wisdom and this knowledge. And he didn't deserve it. It was a gift from God and he was thankful for it. So he wisely goes immediately to God. That's what we should do too. When when things come our way that we aren't expecting. Maybe a beautiful gift comes to you and your family that you weren't expecting or, Someone helps your family out in a way that, that's a marvelous thing, or even a little way. We go to the Lord and we say, thank you, Lord, because you are really working here. It's the Lord that's doing that. It's not me, it's not that other man, but the Lord is working through that other person to benefit me. What a beautiful thing. What another opportunity to be thankful in our lives. We have so many. And to be able to be godly, one must be thankful for all that we have, even the little mundane things that we so often forget about. So, there is wisdom. And Paul says there, and I asked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, he says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. In other words, I can be the wisest man in all the world. There's a lot of men on this earth way wiser than I am that have more knowledge and understanding than I do. But they don't use it for God's benefit. They don't use it for the benefit of the kingdom of God. No, they use it for the benefit of themselves. Or they give credit improperly to other things. So that's one thing that we have to learn. But rather it's in James chapter 3 that we read the wisdom of God. It's first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit. So if you have true wisdom, you don't use it for yourself. That's what Solomon was saying here. I want wisdom not for myself, but wisdom so that I can properly rule the people and be fair and good in my judgments and decisions with them. And that's exactly what Solomon does. When he's given wisdom, he is full of mercy. He brings forth good fruit. He lives a life of peace. He's gentle. And so in all those things, that's how we too should emulate Solomon. We too should want wisdom 
not so that I can be the wisest or the best or have the most money or the best paying job. No, I should desire wisdom so that I can use it for the glory of God's kingdom. I can use it for others around me and not just for myself.